Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started so we can um, uh, get to the fun stuff, but let me just uh, say thank you for being here. My name is Lisa Rodonis and I'm the Dean of the Rady School of Management. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to this year's Global Business Leadership Forum, and I'm pleased that you are here, and we have a great program in store. Um, let me see here. Uh, this year's Global Business Leadership Forum is produced in partnership with the Rady Institute for Supply Excellence and Innovation, and it is my distinct honor to introduce you uh, this morning's moderator, Dr. Hajduk Shin, who is the faculty director for the RIS. EI program. Dr. Shen and the board of ISEI have brought leadership and vision to key topics and courses in supply chain value at the Rady School, putting a spotlight on this important area of research and industry impact, much of which I'm sure uh, real, the Rear Admiral will highlight shortly working, uh, highlight shortly. Um, we are working with many students in our supply chain minor and certificate courses. And thank you to Dr. Shen and all of the ISEI board members in attendance this morning. I'm sure it will be a great presentation. And it is with great and pronounced pride that I'm able to share a, something that many of you do not know. Dr. Shen has been appointed the Jimmy Inkelsario Chair of Innovation and Entrepreneurship for his leadership of uh, excellence in teaching, service, and research. In fact, he has re received so many teaching awards that I think we're gonna have to uh, limit how many he can, he can get because he is truly a model of, of what it means to be a research faculty member in terms of his quality teaching, research and service and he's just a lovely person. Uh, let me share a brief bio of Dr. Shen. Uh, his research interests include forecast information sharing and investment in supply chain management competitive strategies under operational constraints, economics of information technology, software and digital tools, release uh, strategies in motion picture industry and innovation in supply chain. Dr. Shin has published in, in numerous journals, including information systems research, operations research and manufacturing, uh, manufacturing and service operations management. He won the best paper award of uh, the Conference of Information Systems and Technology in 2012 for his paper, Cloud Computing Implications on uh, soft, Software Network Structure and Security Risks with his co-authors, uh, Terry August, who is also a Rady uh, faculty member, and Marius uh, Nicholas Sal. He's a represent, recipient of the 2011 Management Science Merito Meritorious Service Award and the Lieberman Fellowship from Stanford University. Uh, prior to joining the Rady uh, School, Shin was an assistant professor at the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. And at Kellogg, he won uh, the chair's core uh, course teaching award. Uh, Shin earned a PhD from Stanford University and, and an MS in statistics from the University of Chicago and an MS in management engineering and a BS in industrial engineering from the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. And I wanna thank the Inkelsari family, some of whom have joined us this morning for your generous and intentional partnership with the Rady School. And we look forward to celebrating this award with you this year. And now over to Dr. Shen. Thank you, Dean Oldones. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I have the pleasure of welcoming our distinguished speaker, Real Admiral John Polochek, Supply Chain Task Force Lead and Department of Defense, Department of Health and Human Services, Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. The Real Admiral will be sharing great insights this morning. And before we do that, I'd like to provide just a brief background of John Polochek. The Real Admiral graduated from the United States Naval Academy with a Bachelor of Science in Engineering. He holds a Master of Science in Contract and Acquisition Management from the Naval Postgraduate School and a Master of Science in National Resource Strategy from the National Defense University Industrial College of the Armed Forces. He also completed an executive education program at the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth. Polochek's C-duty assignment include 
supply department head towards aboard the fast attack submarine USS Quenfish, the destroyer USS Peterson, and the amphibious assault ship USS Bataan. Polochek assumed the position of Vice Director for Logistics, Logistics Directorate, Joint Staff in June 2017, and is a qualified submarine su supply officer, surface warfare supply corps officer, and member of the defense acquisition professional community. His personal awards include the Defense Superior Service Medal, three of the Legion of Merits, and four awards of Meritorious Service Medal, and another four awards of Navy and Marine Corps Commendation Medal, and Navy and, Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal. Last but not least, I would also welcome Rear Admiral John Polochek to the new member of our advisory board in Institute for Supply Excellence and Innovation. I would really welcome John for that role. So Real Admiral, thank you for joining us. I'll be moderating Q&A following your presentation. So to the audience, if questions come up throughout the talk, please feel free to enter them in the Q&A box. Now, Real Admiral, over to you. Okay, it looks like we have a little bit of a technical issue to see John uh, Polochek. So um, in the meantime, then, <laughs> I would like to um, pass my thanks to the, uh, to the Jimmy and Jennifer and Carceria as well. Um, it has been a, a really great pleasure to work with uh, Jimmy, and I was always fascinated by Jimmy's enthusiasm in the area of supply chain. And also I would like to thank um, ISCI board members, including uh, Banesh Martyr, the chair of the board, as well as Helen Wang, the vice chair of the board. Again, I would like to welcome uh, John Polochek to the board. In addition, um, in this journey, I would also like to uh, name a few of our students and thank them. And first, I would like to thank uh, Garrett, and also Steven Noto, who made this um, John's uh, this um, this event happen, and also I would like to uh, name a few more of my students to thank them, including Jessica, Julian, Talia, Shamili, Kartik, Dan, as well as Nura, and also. Um, for this event to happen, there were tons of other people in the back who are working tenuously to make this happen. Who are the staff for this event? I will say Kate, Monique, Tasha, and Ellis. Again, uh, thank you for, for that. And last but not least, I would also like to thank uh, my academic brother, Terry August. And um, again, this was a, a, a really honored to have that chair. And I would like to thank again, my Dean Lisa Ordonez, as well as uh, the former Dean Bob Sullivan for that too. Um, with that, I hope we will have John soon. If not, I'll be talk a little bit about um, John's experience just um, a, a one more time in terms of his current experience. Um, he is still serving at White House supply chain lead on the coronavirus task force to ensure the healthcare workers get what they need when they need it. And he will speak more about that uh, in today's session. John was brought in from the joint staff to stabilize the supply chain in response to the pandemic in February. So from the February all the way to, to the summer, through the summer, it was quite a journey in a lightning speed. Well, in, in military terms these days, it's called a warp speed. So with that, I will leave it to John. Uh, thanks, Dr. Shin. I had a technical glitch there. I got uh, kicked off the network. 
So I, uh, I appreciate you uh, uh, covering for that, for that period of time. <laughs> so I, uh, first I'd like to thank uh, Dean Ardones uh, uh, for allowing me to, to join and, and uh, speak today uh, and take this opportunity to explain our whole of America approach uh, to uh, the, the supply chain response to the, uh, to the pandemic. And uh, Dr. Shin, for yourself, uh, thank you for your leadership and in, uh, in reaching out to me uh, to, to uh, you know, garner this opportunity. Uh, so a little bit, a little bit about, more about myself, just to, to add some context. So I, uh, I was the vice director for logistics on the joint staff uh, uh, in, um, in uh, March of this year. And in that role as the vice director for logistics, uh, I, uh, I had in our roles and responsibilities uh, planning for um, uh, great power competition, um, read, uh, you know, major conflict with um, uh, uh, major competitors, Russia, China, et cetera. And so in that planning, we, um, we had uh, uh, spent quite a bit of time thinking about industrial base mobilization for great power competition, um, say in the 2030, uh, 2035 uh, mm -hmm. timeframe. And I, I had, uh, since I had spent so much time uh, in that, in that planning, I was uh, versed in working with industry. Um, and, uh, and so when I got moved to, from the joint staff to help health and human services, I brought with me uh, many of the aspects of uh, the DOD planning uh, to the supply chain, uh, the supply chain problem. And so if I can, uh, if I can get the first slide up uh, that uh, says operational setting, that'd be great. And so what I, uh, what I thought I would do today is to take you from uh, uh, middle of March through uh, where we are um, today, essentially the beginning of November, uh, and um, the, uh, the uh, response that, uh, that we did, really my task was to help stabilize the supply chain uh, and get our healthcare workers uh, what they needed um, when they needed it. Uh, and so, um, on a major national, uh, major national scale, and I must, I must start with a little bit of an operational setting. Um, the emergency response framework that runs from the federal government down through the local, uh, local uh, state governments down to the local, uh, is really uh, in uh, is set up to be locally executed, state managed federally supported. So if you think uh, hurricanes, wildfires, um, earthquakes, uh, all of that that's in the federal emergency management agencies um, uh, job jar, so to speak, um, is locally executed, state managed, federally supported. So that's, that's what I fell in on uh, as the president uh, uh, opened the um, emergency response framework and put FEMA in charge. Uh, he declared a national emergency on the 13th of March. FEMA was put in charge on the 16th of March. Uh, and then we, um, uh, then we were, you know, off and, uh, and off and running. As I, uh, as I got pulled from the Pentagon to help in this effort, the strategic national stockpile um, had already been uh, expended and, and really it was uh, distributed uh, pro rata share across the nation uh, in uh, early March. So as I walked in the door, I didn't even have material objects to, to manage. Um, the, federal, the federal stockpile that was really sized for a um, chemical biological event in a geographic area uh, was never designed to be a 50 state, six territory response to a major pandemic. 
uh, some additional uh, operational setting uh, is, uh, you know, infectious disease control relied on disposable protective equipment. Uh, and 80, 80 plus percent of that uh, was really made overseas. We uh, made very little uh, of medical supplies holistically in the United States. Uh, and some items wholly percent uh, reliant, 100% reliant on overseas markets. Uh, for the, those items are like uh, nitrile gloves, uh, the, the surgical gloves uh, that, um, that our healthcare professionals wear. Really, we make um, essentially zero of those in the United States. And that medical supply chain had been um, really uh, cost-driven, relied on just-in-time inventory. Um, hospitals didn't have inventory. States didn't have any inventory. Uh, the commercial market had uh, weeks, if not a month plus or so of inventory on hand. Uh, and so there were not significant echelons of supply sitting on the shelf waiting for a pandemic response. Um, and if I was sitting here talking to you uh, last year, um, the demand from November 2019 to November 2020, and really what, I'm, what I was focused on on this, uh, on this description is uh, March, April timeframe uh, and into the spring, you had three to 400 times pre-COVID demand. And so for example, uh, we manufactured in the United States about 30 million N95 masks um, uh, and five to six million of those N95 masks went to the medical community pre-COVID. Um, I'll get into how we came up with these monthly demand numbers, but really we see the medical demand the medical man somewhere around 160, maybe 180 million masks a month. Um, nitrile gloves, uh, you know, was in the uh, 500 million gloves uh, uh, a month category. We're using about a billion, a billion and a half nitrile gloves um, a, a week. So you can get the scale and magnitude of the ramp up uh, uh, the supply chain uh, had to manage. I get the, the next slide, which should be the operational landscape. Yeah, there you go, thank you. Um, and one of the things that, again, you have to kind of uh, remember is, uh, is this was every state all at once, wanting, um, wanting supplies and having to respond. So, so in the beginning, in March, you know, COVID was essentially, uh, you know, not in every state, but every state, um, every FEMA region. So what I did here is I've broken out the federal response network uh, and the, you see these uh, 10 FEMA regions, um, which include um, the territories. And so um, you have, uh, you have um, many um, uh, uh, partners uh, in this um, in this uh, response network, uh, and realizing that uh, that uh, you had uh, hospitals, nursing homes, um, uh, etc., I reached out and we built a uh, task force that consisted uh, a very inclusive task force that consisted of uh, American Hospital Association. American Nurses Association, American Medical Association, to try to get in those independent doctors that are not aligned to hospitals. Um, the, the National Association of Manufacturers were instrumental, were instrumental in helping us understand the supply chains and who could manufacture what. Uh, the American Healthcare Association, uh, and I can I can go on and on with the associations. The, the Association of Non-Woven Fabric, which I didn't put on the slide, was instrumental in helping us understand how to make more N95 masks uh, in America, uh, along with surgical masks and other non-woven fabric. Um, the non-woven fabric that goes into disposable gowns, surgical masks, um, and, and those types of items. And then you had the plethora of, uh, of federal partners. You had, um, you had the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response who owned the national stockpile. 
in the response frame, medical response framework, uh, Centers for Disease Control, uh, all of the U.S. public health officials uh, across the nation, uh, uh, of course, FEMA, the Food and Drug Administration, uh, and uh, the Defense Department, DOD, uh, Centers for Medicare, Medicaid Services, um, uh, just a, uh, a large uh, array of, um, of, of, the, uh, of the response. The, uh, uh, the National Institute of Health uh, as well, we, we assembled this team, uh, both uh, DOD and across uh, all of these stakeholders to make sure that we were meeting needs across a very wide, um, a very wide span. And, um, and if I can get, uh, if I can get next slide, that'd be, uh, that'd be great. Now, um, as I've laid out, I got pulled from the Pentagon uh, in uh, the week of the March 15th, and I found myself by Friday the 19th uh, in the uh, vice president's office explaining to him how I was going to stand up a task force, bring all of these people in together, along with supply chain professionals from uh, the Department of Defense, the Joint Staff, Defense Logistics Agency, and I developed I developed four lines of effort, and, and really uh, the first three lines of effort that I'm going to go through were to bide time to allow me to get to the fourth line of effort, which I'll spend a little bit of time talking about, which is expansion. Um, and, and so because I came in as the pandemic had already um, uh, you know, started to build and cases uh, in the Northeast were starting to happen and unfortunately deaths. Um, I, uh, I was what I will call um, right of bank. And so uh, as a DOD guy, we, uh, we try to be left of any kind of event in our planning. Uh, and so we have, a, we have a plan, we have a response. Um, we've been able to be thoughtful um, have things uh, ready to go. Uh, I had to develop a response that allowed me to get to um, expanding the manufacturing base and stabilizing the supply chain. And so the first three lines of effort were all designed to allow me to buy, uh, to buy time. So the first line of effort was preservation. Just what it sounds, make our stuff go longer. Uh, uh, make the supplies we have on hand, whether it be a ventilator, whether it be an N95 mask, um, make, make better utilization of it. And so that's where the CDC uh, and the FDA came in and allowed um, emergency use authorizations for the decontamination of uh, uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, they also allowed uh, us uh, to figure out how to make uh, a ventilator go farther. I uh, actually make uh, one ventilator serve more than one patient. Uh, because at that time, if you remember back in, uh, back in March, um, New York uh, Governor, Governor Cuomo indicated that he felt that uh, New York, uh, New York City alone uh, was going to need an additional 50,000 ventilators. Uh, well, that, uh, thank God that never came to pass uh, because we only had about 16 to 17,000 ventilators in the national stockpile. Um, and so we, uh, we first thing we did was figured out how to make ventilators go uh, go farther until we can get uh, to ventilators on order and start making ventilators. Uh, the second line of effort is uh, acceleration, and this really manifested itself in uh, the air bridge. Uh, this uh, line of effort, I'd like you to think about it as um, priming the pump. And so working with uh, the commercial industry. Uh, the likes of Cardinal, uh, McKesson, Henry Schein, Onans and Minor, um, Concordance, et cetera, those organizations, those commercial organizations that had um, uh, material in motion that already feed, uh, uh, you know, uh, 90 some odd percent of the hospital beds uh, in America, along with uh, 90 plus percent of the, the nursing home um, uh, beds, you know, their, their networks um, were still operating. 
Uh, and so what I, what I did was I, I worked with them to reconfigure their maritime uh, modes of transportation and we flew it and the federal government paid for it. Um, I'll go into a little bit more about, uh, about Airbridge on this distribution line of effort, but, but really we, had, uh, we, we, uh, we needed to get material here uh, and really the Airbridge was about beating the 30 day cycle time uh, of a maritime transport to, to bring goods to more, uh, to the Asia side port, you know, load it on a ship, sail it, get it to get it to the West Coast, unload it, uh, get it into the distribution network. And really, again, I was trying to buy time, uh, get more here uh, as faster. Along with that, we uh, we also went uh, went around the globe with a team of people to find new sources of supply. Uh, one of the decisions I made very early on was to not compete with states and local hospitals. Uh, and if we, uh, if we were going to buy something, we were going to buy a supply uh, and a new supplier that was not already destined for a U.S. hospital. Uh, and so uh, all of those stories that say FEMA confiscated, FEMA competed, uh, it's just, uh, just not true. We were very careful. The other thing we did is uh, we worked with the Department of State to ensure um, that when we uh, we bought something overseas to bring it bring it back uh, via the air bridge, that it was an actual supply. And there were a lot of people uh, clamoring to to do business with the federal government, uh, but when you when you went down to it, you know 90 95 percent were all of those people saying that they had access to, they could get, uh, they didn't really have. Uh, and so the Department of State visited a lot of warehouses, a lot of manufacturing plants, um, and to go make sure that we were actually buying product that was uh, genuine and wasn't counterfeit. Uh, we also entered uh, to some uh, contracts with underwriter laboratories to inspect goods, uh, test some items uh, that we were unsure, and, and then all in an effort to make sure that the federal government did not enter something into the medical supply chain that was not destined for, that should not have been destined for a hospital. So again, preservation make it go longer. Acceleration was about finding things across the globe and getting it here faster. Now, uh, the third line of effort that, uh, that helped us was really this distribution line of effort and I'll, I'd, uh, I'd maybe like to rename it uh, called allocation. And, and really this was about managing scarcity because we didn't have enough. Uh, and I had to try to find a way to uh, ensure that those areas with high instance of disease got supplies first. So one of the things I did very early, uh, probably within the first week, I, uh, I uh, asked the uh, Health and Human Service Secretary, Secretary Azar, to, to help me get with um, the large medical supply uh, suppliers, uh, uh, Cardinal, McKesson, et cetera, and give me their transactional business system data. Uh, and so if you can go, uh, if you can go next slide as I can describe uh, the supply chain control tower um, that we built. And so, and so within the first two weeks, uh, working with industry uh, and, uh, and the commercial market, I was getting uh, feeds from their business systems uh, to allow me to, to see um, their networks, their supply chains. And uh, we received their transactional business system data. And we started, we started small. Uh, we started with maybe five or six items and really focused on personal protective equipment first. Uh, and um, we got their business system data uh, and we had to do something called normalizing um, the SKUs. And so, um, you know, uh, McKesson has a range of SKUs, uh, uh, item identity codes for N95 masks. Cardinal has a different set of SKUs, et cetera, et cetera. And so we, we've worked to say all of these SKUs for all of these people and all of this data that we put into the cloud at FEMA and brought supply chain visualization tools in from DOD so we can make a mask a mask. And so by, by the, before the second week of April, I combined nine business systems 
to allow me to see um, what was coming in from manufacturing into the commercial network and what was going to be distributed and more importantly orders from customers so again these nine um, distributors uh, supply chain companies for medic for the medical supply chain they covered about 95 percent of the hospital beds in the united states and about the same percentage of nursing home beds and so I could aggregate national demand from their orders and understand what their fill rates were, how well they were uh, able to respond to that demand. Uh, and so, so now I had uh, the ability to see what was coming in from manufacturing, what was in warehousing, what was going to be distributed, and where. And so if you gave me your, uh, the hospital you were born in, I could tell you in a matter of minutes how many N95 masks they had on order uh, and how many they got delivered over the last couple of weeks uh, in any range of data set. And so, and so what we did to manage scarcity was we took this network that we developed and overlaid Dr. Burks's um, epilogical uh, data where the disease was and we created um, a mosaic of about 100 counties uh, on a 96 hour cycle to where, um, where the priorities would be. And we shared that with the commercial sector. So as we flew product in from overseas, I could see it land, hit warehouses, and then I could see it to go to the geographic areas that we designed. We also, uh, besides geographically orientating the network, we orientated them by the point of care. What I mean by that is uh, the first priority was public hospitals. because We felt that those were unfunded would serve um, communities of racial diversity and economic diversity. So public hospitals first, then VA hospitals, then private hospitals, uh, and then um, nursing homes, first responders, and, uh, and on down the line. Uh, and, so, and so very early in the pandemic, uh, really by the second week of April, uh, I had good visibility on where product was moving to, where product was uh, designed and destined to go, and allowed me to uh, orientate uh, the network to the highest need. Again, preserve, accelerate it, prime the pump, manage, uh, manage scarcity. Now, since, um, since the summer, uh, since really June into July, the bottom half of this, uh, this presentation is we've added data from uh, the hospitals and nursing homes. And so now we're getting via Teletrack and the National Health Safety Network uh, days of supply and quantity of items on hand at hospitals. And uh, we kept it much simpler for nursing homes, just days of supply. And now we're concentrating on the five to eight percent of hospitals that say they don't have um, two weeks or more of uh, or more of supplies. And um, like any other event, we continue to work on data quality. There are um, uh, there are some issues with reporting um, there, you know, we, uh, we're not grabbing the days of supply from hospitals and uh, the numbers of each of things from hospitals. We're not grabbing that electronically. Uh, so a, a hospital staff member has to enter it in to teletrack. Uh, but uh, we're, we're working through um, all of those. But really, I, I hope you can understand that 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 health and human services and the federal government has now got uh, very good visibility across the supply chain. And I like to say that, that really the bottom half is, I now know the effects of the things we did and are doing um, on the frontline healthcare workers, whether it be in a hospital or, um, or, or nursing home. And so if I can, uh, if I can leave this slide and uh, go to the next slide, Uh, I'll talk about, uh, uh, I'll give you uh, uh, the kind of the ecosystem that, um, that we've created. And really, the framework for the response going forward um, uh, is 
this IT system in the middle, because you can't, you can't manage a supply chain unless you can see it and understand what's going on in it uh, and use the, the data, the information that you have, the data and the end, then the information to make decisions. And so really uh, where we are today is the ability to command and control the supply chain and understand um, what's going on at the state level, uh, what's going on at the point of care, how the commercial network is, uh, is uh, feeding the um, nursing homes, hospitals, uh, and then using the national stockpile um, as that final, uh, that final resort. Uh, and really, so if you remember, locally executed, state managed, fairly supported. Uh, when, a point, when we identify a point of care that is, uh, that's less than say two weeks of supply, in any item, whether it be a ventilator drug, that's now in the supply chain, whether it's a swab for testing, that's now in the supply chain tool, et cetera, et cetera. We have a conversation first with the commercial marketplace to, hey, can you feed this hospital? They're, they're having an issue. If there's not enough volume there, we go to the state, state feeds their hospital in their state. And then finally, we've set up the ability to ship directly from the national stockpile to a point of care if needed, or we can give it to the state and the state can give it to, um, uh, to that hospital. The national stockpile uh, now uh, looking to be backed up by um, a, uh, a set of strategic contracts from uh, manufacturing. And so if I can go to the, go to the next slide uh, in, in, uh, in this presentation, where, uh, I want to get back to expansion. And so you cannot, you cannot do everything I say in that cycle of life and manage um, the supply chain without um, expanding the domestic uh, uh, manufacturing capability for all of these items. I don't, I don't care if it was uh, N95 mask, um, fentanyl to, to sedate somebody, to put them on a ventilator, um, we worked across all of these different supplies and broke them down to their components um, and gave uh, that aggregated national demand to acquisition professionals, supply chain professionals, buyers at um, the Department of Defense. And they went off and they used uh, the tools to go expand U.S. manufacturing to make more, uh, all at the same time where we're using preservation, we're using uh, acceleration to fly it here, and we're managing some scarcity. But really, that supply chain control tower was one of the uh, uh, aggregating national demand out of there, along with other sources, so we can uh, have a holistic uh, picture of what would be uh, national demand to expand to. Uh, so if I can go, uh, I can go next slide. But one of the primary tools was uh, the Defense Production Act. Uh, and this, uh, this summer, I think, is uh, from early in October. So there's been a few more actions uh, since then that I, I didn't capture on this, uh, on this chart. But um, we started with uh, DPA Title I, and you see those 13 actions there. Those are really the ventilator contracts. Title I authority is um, uh, Title I authority is uh, the ability to rate contracts and and get in the front of the line, and so that's what we did with uh, the ventilators. We said, okay, we're going to uh, give you a contract for uh, uh, something under two hundred thousand ventilators. Uh, I think it was about two hundred thousand uh, with this dollar value here. Uh, with, a, with 11 to 13 different contracts. And uh, we're going to be, whatever you do, you're gonna give the federal government a head in line. That authority also flows down through the supply chain. And so you can get ahead of a line uh, for uh, tooling and other manufacturing, uh, other piece parts to assemble the ventilator it flows down through there. So that was the first thing we did because if you remember, again, if you remember back in early March, Governor Cuomo was very vocal about um, running out of ventilators in the state of New York. 
the next authority that we used was uh, DPA Title III, uh, where um, it, uh, DOD had been given um, a pot of money uh, to expand the industrial base. Uh, so Title III is the expansion. So now you see um, six actions there. But really, if you look down to this CARES Act and HCA under Health and Human Services, that's uh, that Congress appropriated money and gave Health and Human Services the same authorities that under D DPA Title III to make investments in manufacturing, domestic manufacturing, to increase capabilities and capacity. So we switched from the DOD authority to this uh, CARES Act authority that Health and Human Services gave us. So I can go, uh, I can go next slide. Uh, so you can see here, uh, DPA Title I, as I indicated, uh, ventilators. Uh, and we also used it to, for some pure, uh, pressured, uh, purified air, pressured respirators, PAPRs. Um, and you can see uh, uh, Puritan, we rated, we rated some contracts with them. And Puritan is the primary swab manufacturer in the United States. So if you have gotten a COVID test, uh, there's probably about a 98% probability that you had a Puritan swab up your nose. Um, and we had to use the DPA Title I to rate some orders with them to allow them to get head of line services for some machine shop um, uh, making of things to help their production capabilities. Uh, and then you can see McKesson listed here for um, vaccine distribution. Uh, you can go next slide. So that's some DPA Title I uh, authority use. And so I got two slides here on industrial base expansion efforts. Now this is the combination of the DPA Title III authorities and the Health and Human Services CARES Act authority. And so you can, again, you can see uh, screening and diagnostics retesting. Uh, we, uh, we had several um, uh, 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 increases and in expansions with Puritan to make enough swabs to get to um, millions of tests a day uh, and I think we're on target to hit somewhere about um, uh, 10 million tests uh, a day in the United States as we turn the calendar page uh, into, into January. I believe we're at about 3 million tests a day now, and not just swabs, but all of the tests that go in there. And you could see uh, Hologic was a test, BD Veritor was tests, Biofire Defense, Copan, again, were swabs, Q Health is a, uh, is a test. Uh, teal plastics and tea cans were tips, uh, plastic tips, pipette tips to, to uh, increase testing capacity at our, at our big labs. And really, uh, tea can, believe it or not, those pipette tips also test our national uh, blood supply. And so we were running out of pipette tips to not only do testing, but test the, the, our blood supply. Um, and then you can see uh, we uh, invested in an, uh, an on-demand new uh, manufacturing capability uh, for uh, pharmaceuticals, which uh, I'll touch again here uh, here later. Uh, now uh, uh, you can see that, that you know it's um, a systematic way to go through uh, the supply chains. The uh, if I can go next slide. Uh, and uh, now here comes uh, uh, this primary slide is uh, a lot of personal protective equipment, uh, 3M, Honeywell, Onions and Miner, uh, Moldex, uh, their uh, expansion for N95 respirators. So again, we took N95 respirators from about uh, 30 million masks a month. Uh, and now we're about 160, 180. As we get into January, it'll be over 200 million masks a month. And really, as we get by the spring, we think with all new entrants into the marketplace, we'll have about 250 million masks a month being produced domestically. Uh, and you can see uh, uh, needles and sy syringes. And really, um, the non-woven community, uh, you know, you had to make more fabric, more non-woven fabric to make uh, more um, uh, N95 masks and surgical masks. And you can see gloves, surgical masks. 
we had to dive the ventilator supply chains. There were some piece parts and filters that we needed. Uh, you know, when you go from making about 36,000 ventilators a year in the United States, and then, you know, within six months, you're going to make 200,000. Um, you can imagine that there are some piece parts and things that, um, that everybody's trying to use to go do that. Now, now if I can have, uh, if I can have next slide. Uh, and so, yeah, I think you, you gave a, I think uh, you can get an understanding that we, uh, we uh, went through aggregated national demand, figured out um, each piece part of the supply chain, and then went to grow, gr went to grow U.S. manufacturing. And so, uh, you know, here we are with a national stockpile conversation again. And again, in March, we had about 18 million N95 respirators. And, uh, and some, you know, some hospital systems will tell you some things that they got out of the national stockpile um, did not have the best shelf life management. Um, but, you know, we'll just say 18 million. We, uh, we're on target to have about 300 million by the end of December. Uh, you can see surgical masks, where we were and where we're going to. Uh, the national stockpile, um, not only uh, uh, the items that you see here, but um, we added greater um, uh, breadth and depth. And so depth being going from 18 million to 300 million. Breadth is there weren't swabs in the national stockpile. There were not, um, uh, uh, there were no ventilator drugs. Uh, the, the drugs needed to intubate uh, a patient and uh, and put it on a uh, and put it on a, put them on a ventilator. There was no uh, there was no drugs like that in the stockpile, and so we've had to create a greater range of items to have uh, on the shelf. Uh, and so uh, you know, kind of where we are today, I know uh, uh, firsthand that um, um, you know, well more than eighty some odd percent of states have more than 30 days. And I'm being somewhat conservative there. Um, uh, really, the number is closer to 50 or 60 days. Um, most states have more than uh, have 60 days of supply. Uh, we've recommended to, to state governments to have a 60-day supply. Um, the national stockpile, we believe, will now have a 90-day supply in it and uh, be able to use that supply chain control tower with data driven to, and rapid commercial distribution, uh, looking to have, uh, looking to build in a vendor managed inventory because really all of these items are gonna be uh, delivered and put in government warehouses all about the same time. Uh, and so I, uh, we are worried about uh, shelf life management. Um, and, and really, as I talked to you today, um, the commercial uh, side, as we look at hospital systems, um, many hospital systems have uh, much more than 30 days. Many hospital systems have what they believe is five to six months worth of supplies. Um, so now, uh, if I can go uh, next slide and kind of get into some final thoughts. Um, we're in a much different spot. Um, you know, preparedness, uh, uh, for any kind of event, um, uh, you know, if you're not uh, if you're not prepared and you find yourself right of bang, you know, time certainly becomes the the enemy. Um, uh, not quite sure the, the nation as a whole um, took a, a real understanding of the resiliency and our dependencies. Now, there are today we're in place. Uh, both from the, the Federal Emergency Management Agency and uh, the Health and Human Services Department, um, preparedness grants uh, that, uh, that helps states um, work through preparedness. And really the items for Health and Human Services, uh, that money was to go help for medical preparedness and really to go buy, um, to go buy items and go get, uh, get prepared. Uh, uh, and so really as a national question is, you know, how might we prepare ourselves um, left the bank better than we were for um, this pandemic? Secondly, um, 
health and human services never viewed their role as having to manage a medical industrial base. Now, coming from the, the defense department, we have, um, we have two uh, uh, industrial bases. We have an organic industrial base. So we have shipyards, um, aviation depots um, that are organic to the Department of Defense man manned with, um, with uh, DOD civilians uh, to help us surge in time of crisis. Um, they fix airplanes, they fix ships, but we also have a um, domestic defense industrial base. And we spend a lot of time making sure that there's um, capability there to um, produce what's next and produce what's needed in time of crisis. And so Health and Human Services is now uh, gonna be left with this expanded industrial base and, and the, they must develop the ability to continually monitor demand and supply in the nation and find ways to keep the industrial base viable. Um, the, uh, you know, at some point when uh, vaccine happens and vaccine will happen um, and uh, we're out of the pandemic and national demand for N95 masks five years from now or whatever the date is, goes back to 6 million masks a month. Um, all of the expansion that we did, uh, health and human services, with the help of Congress, et cetera, must figure out how to maintain that. Now, I have a vignette from DOD. We, uh, we have full magazines of Tomahawk cruise missiles. So I'll use that as an example for as a, as a Navy officer. Um, so Tomahawk cruise missiles from, uh, from, uh, from the Navy. We have full magazines. We have enough Tomahawk cruise missiles, we believe, for any uh, contingency um, uh, that, uh, that, that might, they might be needed for. But we still buy Tomahawk cruise missiles um, every year. And we do that on low rate production. It costs more than full rate production, but we do that to keep the production lines open and warm and to be able to surge if needed. That might be um, uh, something that uh, in the future, working with, working with Congress, Health and Human Services, um, uh, uh, they're going to have to come figure out how to maintain what, uh, what we built. Uh, the national stockpile, it's got to be viewed more than just items on the shelf. And really, really, that's, that's where the nation was um, back in March. It was, hey, I have some items on the shelf. We feel like we're, uh, we're ready. And really, they were not backed up by domestic surge contracts. They didn't have a real great way of managing shelf life. There are a lot of conversations that Congress uh, will need to have to figure out how to resource a national stockpile that um, is a real stockpile that can surge to, um, to that demand. How might we make a long-term investment to manage a supply chain? Now, I gave you a glimpse into what we had to go build for the medical. Pick a cyber event. What if we had to manage food in the same way we had to manage medical? What if something happened to disrupt the food supply chains? And oh, by the way, COVID did interrupt the food supply chain. I had to work with the Department of Agriculture. If you remember back in uh, April, May, uh, there were outbreaks in meatpacking plants, the protein industry, so to speak. Um, and we had to go reconfigure their plants to keep workers safe, test all the workers, uh, help, uh, help uh, likes of Tyson Foods and JBS Meats and many others to go figure out how to operate a food plant um, safely in a COVID environment to keep the nation fed. Um, you, can, you can go on and on. You can see um, that um, there's many parallels to many other events that can happen. Um, and really, uh, I, I, we need to invest in uh, an agile manufacturing base. So in pharmaceuticals, um, you know, make, uh, to make your blood pressure medicine, to make insulin, to make anything that you might need, to make a drug to be able to put somebody to sleep so you can put them on a ventilator. It all starts with starter chemicals, advanced pharmaceuticals. And again, a lot of that is not made in the United States. Um, 
uh, we're dependent on Asia for, for a lot, dependent on India for a lot. Um, we invested in uh, new technologies called continuous manufacturing, continuous flow of pharmaceuticals using the petrochemicals that we, uh, we have today in the United States, be able to continuously do the chemistry, time, pressure, temperature, et cetera, to change it from what it is to the drug that you need. Um, investing in those technologies uh, uh, should provide us the ability to surge um, additional uh, uh, medications needed. One of the other things we did in the national stockpile because we're wholly somewhat dependent on overseas advanced pharmaceuticals, we're stockpiling advanced pharmaceuticals in case those supply chains uh, get disrupted. On and on and on. Same thing can go for textile manufacturing. You know, what, what if you, uh, you had an agile um, textile base where you can go from making t-shirts one day to um, turn, the, uh, turn the knobs and dials and, and put new uh, trons in the uh, machinery and now you're making surgical masks or you're making isolation gowns uh, instead of having to figure out how to hand sew uh, those items. And finally, the Defense Production Act is a, uh, is a great tool um, but hard to surge from zero. Uh, and so uh, you can see that we've expanded the US industrial base. It takes time, it takes time to pour concrete, it takes time to make machinery, it takes time to train people, it takes, it takes time. It's a great tool. Um, and uh, I would just kind of leave you with, um, how do we not have to surge from zero uh, again, and I think, I think if the if the, the holistic picture of looking at our resiliency and dependencies, you know, clearly it's um, it's not a zero or a hundred percent. Hey, we want to be zero dependent on other countries, or or you know, we think we found out being a hundred percent is not great either. You know, I don't know what the number is. Um, I know it's not zero and it's not 100. Um, and, uh, and also, um, is it all in the United States or is it in um, Mexico, in Canada? Or is it in um, Central America, Mexico, Canada? I, right? I, I think that's the conversation, not just for medical items, electronics, clothing. You can just go on and on, uh, on, and on about that. And so, uh, Dr. Shin, uh, I think uh, I think that I am done with uh, presentation, and I think this is where um, you might move to uh, to questions. Absolutely, um, John. What a great uh, presintation! It also uh, reminds me your emphasis on the time, right? Uh, that definitely resonated with me very well. Um, we have a lot of questions. So without further ado, let's go with the questions. Um, so first question uh, from the audience to you, John. Um, this is from Jimmy. And the question is about the supply chain culture in the government, right? In particular, in the US government. So um, to him, it seems to be sort of the government in culture is more slanted toward confrontation with suppliers. For example, you know, the typical three bid and a cloud of dust. So what efforts are being made to create a culture of collaboration based on solid analytics and strategic sourcing? And we see some of that uh, for sure in world-class private sector companies. So wh what have done or already uh, being done in terms of the culture in US government. Hey, thanks, great. I think, uh, let, me, uh, let, me, let me just restate that because uh, I, I, I think I get what he's, uh, what he's going after. Um, yeah, right, so, so normally it's um, three quotes and, uh, and uh, lowest price, et cetera. Um, certainly somewhat during the response of the pandemic, um, we, uh, there was lots of um, uh, uh, urgent and compelling to go sole source to, uh, to vendors, right? Um, we are now at the point where uh, I, uh, I, certainly, I certainly agree. 
we are now at the point where uh, for the national stockpile, for um, going forward, it is time to get into those strategic contracts and do the analytics and the planning and the forecasting. So um, a, a very interesting conversation with the uh, US textile base who were used to working with the Defense Logistics Agency uh, and would get a series of, you know, forecasts. Hey, uh, you know, I'm gonna need this many a pair of boots. I'm gonna need this many uniform items. I'm gonna, right? And we share that information to our strategic suppliers. Um, yeah, we are, uh, we are working with Health and Human Services to get them to that, uh, to that level. Now, again, remember, Health and Human Services never had to manage a medical industrial base. And so uh, we, in, this, in the acquisition environment, Health and Human Services had very small um, acquisition and contracting bandwidth. And so I used uh, acquisition and contracting people from Department of Defense, from FEMA, the rest of the Department of um, uh, Homeland Security, uh, et cetera, uh, across the board, uh, because Health and Human Services had a very small cadre of people. And so one of the things that they are trying to do is to grow that professionalism. Um, the other thing that may happen is Health and Human Services may get into like a hybrid um, state with um, the Department of Defense. They may have the technical experts uh, to um, run um, the requirements, but allow the Department of Defense to do um, the uh, the demand planning and manage the uh, manage the contract. That sounds interesting. And the next question is. Um, what constraints, right, in particular labor, equipment, and et cetera, did you have to address to create supply? And how did you overcome? Yeah, great. Um, and so, uh, yeah, all of it, right? And so, uh, so let me just take, uh, let me just take the example of, um, of nitrile gloves. Uh, the, it's all of it. Um, you know, we, uh, we may, we, I, again, I, you know, I alluded to, we're using about a billion, billion and a half nitro gloves a week. We made in the United States pre-COVID about 500 million a year. And so not only do you have to then go figure out, you know, get the machinery, it's not just that's, you know, we can make um, and bring in uh, and make the machinery that makes nitro gloves. And they're really big. They're like uh, more than a football field long um, because it, the process to make a glove, to make it, um, to have a glove turn out to be 10 cents, the machine's really big, right? Or a penny <laughs> a glove, excuse me, right? Machines are really long. Not only do you have to then um, get the machinery, you know, we got to go figure out how to get uh, in line to get the raw material, right, to, to go do that. Mm -hmm. And where in the United States will have the right um, infrastructure, water, power, all of those things. And so the acquisition professionals at the Department of Defense had to go work with industry. And again, my beginning slide of all of the associations well, there's an association of the manufacturers, the association of manufacturers help us work with all of the people that are making gloves. We do make gloves in the United States, vinyl gloves. We make uh, rubber gloves for um, uh, other uh, industrial applications. We have people that have the technology to make gloves. It's just not on the scale of nitro gloves uh, for there, right? So we had to go work with them to figure out all of the piece parts and certainly labor and machinery are part of uh, a, a part of that. Where again, the defense production aid is a great tool, but you can't surge zero. It's it's amazing to hear that to make that little glove, you need a football size equipment, right? Full field size equipment. 
it's um it's it's amazing and the next question is actually from dan um what are the mark metrics that you are using to determine days of supply is it for the worst case usage numbers like uh, new york city head back in spring yeah that's a uh, that's a question that's a great uh, a great question metrics um and so uh the answer is variable um uh, we are uh we are continually looking uh to, to update those metrics um, and um, it's uh, we're using hospitalizations, COVID cases, and hospitalizations a day, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, those hospitalizations a day equal so many supplies, and so we've adjusted those over time, uh, and um, you, you know there's nothing like, you know you can you can demand plan, and forecast, but there's nothing like actual data, uh, actual usage information. And so um, one of the things the supply chain tower has allowed us to go do is to now have visibility and start to build um, actual burn rates. So Teletrack gives us the ability to understand COVID cases and COVID patients in a hospital, their length of stay, and now we can see their usage rates of supplies, whether it be ventilator drugs, N95 masks. And so we're now trying to do the analytics to, uh, to get down to the point of care utilization rate. So that's why I say it's bearable. Um, there are a lot of planning uh, mechanisms, but yeah, now we have, uh, now we have the data uh, to try to go make those. And that was all part of aggregating national demand and trying to figure out what would be a monthly rate to expand to. And we think we have it mostly right. It's not, it's not perfect, but, but mostly right. Starting from the micro level data, building up that aggregate level, I can say that's quite a challenge. Right. Okay, so the next question is from Corey. Um, his question is, in your acceleration line of effort, um, was consideration given to enabling probably through funding or rapid approvals to university and private sector grassroots solutions? Um, he said University of Illinois rapid vent emergency ventilators come to his mind. Um, he, he referenced the expansion line of effort. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah, very much so. So, uh, uh, yeah, I knew, you know, so here's, here's something that I didn't focus on. I'll just be, uh, I'll just be honest with you. Face shields. Because uh, as I talked to many hospital systems in March and early April, every one of them were aligned to some university or somebody who are 3D printing face shields. Mm -hmm. And it was a consortium of additive manufacturers that were working on shareable designs for HB printers and whatever, you know, name your, name your 3D printer. Um, and that uh, they were working together, consortiums were working together to go do that. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I also thought we were going to be able to 3D print our way out of the swab problem. Um, but that became tougher because each test, uh, each lab, um, had a little bit of a different requirement. And so it kind of fell upon the lab or the test to qualify that 3D printed swab. But we worked on a set of procedures to go, to go do that. And really, um, places like MIT, uh, other uh, 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 school universities, schools, they were instrumental in a lot of that work. Uh, across the nation. And so um, we, uh, we spent a lot of time, as I found somebody that was doing something, we added to that list, to our list of sources of supply, so to speak. And so when we came across a hospital, we came across somebody that was struggling with um, a swab, a face shield. We gave them uh, multiple universities that, that were doing work um, and so it wasn't always a commercial entity, a company, an out-for-profit. Um, 
we harnessed um, we harnessed a lot of universities um, and really did not have to give them investment dollars to go uh, to go do that. They uh, they they found the way to go do that. And there were a lot of Americans. There were a lot of American companies that did not get Defense Production Act money, uh, but turned their uh, their their production at the time of need. I uh, I remember meeting with. Um, I forget the gentleman's name, but everybody knows the commercial, the the my pillow guy. He uh, he converted from making pillows to cloth face masks, and so he was one of the first guys that started making cloth face masks and uh, things like that. So I know that there are a lot of great Americans out there, and this whole American response certainly the universities uh, helped out, and really they helped out in the additive manufacturing. Definitely, with the size of the pandemic, it comes everyone together, right, to, to cope with that. Okay, so the next question, uh, this is definitely related to the future, uh, which is about, uh, that comes, comes to my mind first is the vaccine, right? And actually, um, both Richard and Jimmy asked this question. So the question is, will this be the same supply chain planning customized for vaccine distribution? And specifically, um, you know, given that the next big crisis will be actually how to distribute this vaccine, do you envision using um, other distributors than McKesson, right? For example, say Cardinal, Shine, and et cetera. And yeah. if so, sorry, uh, can you put together a task force of, let's say, competitors getting together to develop a common strategy in the interest of the country? Yeah, so uh, in, in all full disclosure, um, uh, the, uh, the, the administration set up um, a separate task force. So um, initially, um, uh, uh, well, before Operation Warp Speed um, uh, uh, was stood up, and, really, and uh, you have to understand, I am not Operation Warp Speed. I was... Um, father of Operation Warp Speed, so to speak. Um, Operation Warp Speed is wholly responsible for development of vaccine and uh, the distribution of uh, of the vaccine. And so they uh, they uh, they borrowed um, uh, the supply chain control tower. Uh, and they uh, they are they've taken it in a um, uh, a different uh, a different way. So they they saw what we built and then uh, used it to uh, take it as a model and uh, worked with um, industry to um, tailor it to the vaccine. Now. Uh, Having uh, having said that, you know McKesson got a very large contract to go uh, to go do the distribution. Um, I know that there's other pharmacy, there's retail pharmacies, there's CVS, Walgreens, Walmart. Um, the administration is going to have a mosaic built of ways to get it to um, everyone now. Vaccinating healthcare workers at a hospital will probably have a different distribution network um, and may, may be primarily of the, um, of the vaccine that is, um, uh, I, I, I think it's um, uh, Moderna that's, uh, or Pfizer, I forget which one, that has the significant cold chain. It may be easier for that um, to be distributed at a hospital. Now, uh, I know Johnson and Johnson's vaccine is a single dose. It might it might not have the significant cold chain. Well, that might be the one where um, you give to the average American if it proves effective. That um, CVS, Walgreens, and everybody else there, the nursing home, the most vulnerable. Um, you know, they're working on ways to track that, you know, you, uh, each one of those vaccines that are double dose, you got to give that person within 21 days, 28 days, that same vaccine. And I think that same lot or batch uh, of vaccine. So there's lots of tracking there. 
And so I think the early vaccinations, that's why you'll see um, uh, uh, building there. They're not only building to track where every vial is, they're, track, they're building a network to understand who has gotten it because they're going to have to follow it up with another dose. So it's a, it's a different problem set, but they took the supply chain control tower we built, brought it over to warp speed and, you know, changed it to for, for their use. So they didn't start from zero. Mm -hmm. Great, great. So now let's move into sort of a future question. Um, let's start from the government side. <clears throat> What actions do you believe the federal government will take left of boom in a possible future pandemic? Have there been any plans drawn for this kind of scenarios? Yeah, so um, so here's uh, here's what I uh, you know had many conversations with the Government Accounting Office (GAO), which is the which is is Congress's audit arm, and uh, and really it it gets down to. Um, one, what should the national stockpile look like? How should it be managed? How should it be resourced? And how do you keep the industrial base um, viable for the long run? You know, uh, you know, how do you how do you prevent again? What's different between March and today is in March hospitals didn't have any inventory. Mm -hmm. The supply chain uh, companies had um, months of inventory. Uh, and then um, uh, the um, uh, federal government did not have a significant uh, stockpile. The uh, stockpile was not backed up by surge contracts. Today, hospitals have stuff States have things, stockpiles bigger. We have an industrial, US industrial base to now uh, have surge contracts from. How might we make sure five years from now that that's all still there? And so one of the authorities that health and human services uh, might need that they don't have today so think of the 300 million N95 masks that will be in the stockpile. My prediction, there'll be hundreds of millions of masks in the stockpile a year from now. Mm -hmm. They're all going to have a shelf life that's going to come due five years, right? So, so how might Health and Human Services have the authority um, to do what I'll call use a uh, uh, either sell from the national stockpile to the commercial marketplace? or um, have a working capital fund to be able to give to other, D other federal partners, the VA, um, DOD, um, sell to others overseas like, um, like we do for um, uh, weapon systems, uh, federal, uh, uh, foreign military sales, right? Or maybe it's foreign medical sales. Um, and the ability to then take that cash and capital and reinvest it and rotate the stock. There are various ways to go enter into that. Mm -hmm. Annual appropriations to the Department of Health and Services, um, Health and uh, Human Services is not the answer. It will be too hard. We'll get to where we were again, where those appropriations didn't work out well, uh, didn't get supported, uh, and the stockpile will get depleted, all right? and, and will not allow us to go figure out how to keep all of that production that was now made. What are the taxes, the tariffs, all those other economic levers that need to get pulled? Uh, and again, are we okay with um, some of that being in Mexico, some of that being in Canada, right? I mean, what is that mosaic? And so I think we have, we have a, a significant national dialogue that has to happen um, and Congress has to has to drive a lot of this because they own the resources of it, and uh, and you have to you're going to have to resource a way to go forward on all of those levers. Mm -hmm. That's that's absolutely a, a very relevant point, even in terms of a future future strategy of the supply chain for national strategic stockpile management, right? 
including also, uh, I fully agree with you about a bigger discussion on whether the supply chain coming back from China to US or to Mexico or even to Canada. Right? Yeah, now uh, I, I will add in, you know, we're not like globalization is not gonna go away, right? Like, so how do you do this with an understanding that you're still in globalization? And you're not, again, it's, it's, it's this conversation. I, I don't think it's a conversation of zero or a hundred percent, but what you can't serve zero. So if that's not the answer, what do you build? And to still rely on globalization and how do you make, how do you make the, the manufacturing that you do need viable and cost competitive uh, going down the line? That's why I, I, I say my, one of my final thoughts about an advanced and agile manufacturing base. I think that there will there'll need to be additional resources placed at agile and advanced manufacturing uh, so we can turn on a dime, so we, you can make it cheaper. You can do all of those things that um, – that remain cost competitive. I think there's a there's lots to chew on in here from a lessons learned and pandemic response. Absolutely. Also related to more flexible, right? right. Um, now let's move on to the leadership uh, aspect of it. So I'll ask so two people actually, including Susanna Zhu, asked this question: uh, What best prepared you for this sort of a leadership role, and how did you have to change your own perspectives to solve the problem, right? Mm -hmm. And what challenges did you have with regard to change management to alter the thinking of those needed to achieve success? Yeah, that uh, this whole this section might take another conference. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, so let me uh, let, let me let me do this. Um, and so uh, you know, we we I know I dropped off, and you probably spent a little bit of time going about my background, but really. Um, uh, I have an interesting background from uh, the Department of Defense. I am, uh, I am, uh, I grew up as a supply chain guy. Every Navy supply corps officer is a supply chain manager. But with that, I also have a background in acquisition and contract management. So I went to the Naval Postgraduate School um, to, uh, for an MBA uh, specializing in, in, the acquisition, major program acquisition of, of supplies, services, weapon systems. So I have an acquisition background, a contracting background. I also then have spent a series of time working financial management for um, the Navy. I was uh, an aide for uh, Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Financial Management. I was in a program office, the Seawolf program office that I managed. Um, uh, the financial management aspects and all of the acquisition reports, all the data and analytics that goes into, are we going to deliver on time? Uh, so I have a contracting and major program acquisition background, a financial management background, and I've spent lots of time at the operational level planning. Pl not only planning for supply chain, but everything uh, else with that, all the logistics, the transportation, um, just pick a commodity like uh, petroleum, fuel, um, the ability to go to war, so to speak, and understanding your daily burn rate of fuel, where is it positioned, how are you going to get it there, um, et cetera. Along with my time in the joint staff of understanding um, how to expand the industrial base and in times of, of uh, national need, and what does that look like in the future? So I've had a 33, 34 year career that's uh, spanned both supply chain acquisition and I felt very comfortable working with industry. And, and I felt very strongly that um, DOD's success is inextricably linked to commercial industry. Um, uh, when you think about how we get to war, um, we, the, the uh, troops fly on whitetails, whitetails being commercial aircraft. Um, we use maritime transport to move equipment, mostly via commercial. Um, our, uh, you know, we don't have warehouses of uh, frozen dead cow, so to speak, for food. We rely on the food supply chain. It's all back in the commercial sector that allows us to surge 
And so we spend a lot of time working with industry and doing that forecasting and planning, right? And so I took that approach. I took that whole of America approach and understanding, hey, look, there are people, there are companies that do the medical supply chain. Let me not supplant that. Let me support it. And so you, that first slide with all of the second, maybe the second slide with all of the associations and federal partners to do that in a COVID environment, like we're sitting here today, I didn't care where you were. I didn't care if you were in Atlanta and CDC in Atlanta, teleworking in your home in DC, I uh, tapped into the Department of Defense. One of the things that um, uh, the Defense Department did for me was they stood up a, um, a joint acquisition task force. And so they, they grouped together um, uh, people from across uh, the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, uh, all of the acquisition professionals in various programs uh, were at my disposal to go do this expansion of the industrial base and go buy things for me, the Defense Logistics Agency. And so it really, it was a coordinating effort. Um, not unlike what you do on the joint staff, coordinating across all of the combatant commanders, coordinating across all of the services. And so I think, I think it's a blend of my background, my, my willingness to an understanding to work with industry uh, to develop a large wholesale, uh, a large scale whole of America approach to the response. And I know it's a very long winded question, but I, I felt it needed to kind of go back to, to, to get there. Sure, uh, great, John. And, and here is the last question, and I will say the most difficult question for you, okay? Um, this is actually from Bob Nash. Um, and, and please, uh, I will say, I will ask you a question and I'll also add one. Um, what do you think we should be telling to our young adults, like millennials, university students, to guide them so that they have safer lives as well as job potential? in one sentence. Uh, you know, I would, uh, uh, you know, uh, I would sum it up as, being, as uh, be a team player and be proactive. Great, that's, I will say our final takeaway, be team player and be proactive with that. Thank you very much, John Polochek, for joining this uh, webinar. And thank you all for joining this. And again, uh, thank you very much uh, to Dean Oldones as well. It, it was great. Thank you all. <laughs>